All right. Well, welcome back. Hope you had a good supper or dinner, whichever way you refer to it as. Uh, Tom Dunn is up next. Tom is, um, yes, please. Tom is, uh, along with uh, Jared Cressman, hosts of uh, Through the Black. How many of you listen to Through the Black? There you go. Good, 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 good. Um, and also produced uh, Detestable, the movie. How many of you have seen that? Wow. Well, then Tom doesn't need any introduction, um, but let's give him a warm welcome anyway. Check, one, two, that works, that works. Okay, thank you so much, Mike. Appreciate it so much. Man, I, um, I used to put on conferences like this, and I'm glad I'm not doing them anymore. Uh, they're a lot of work. I remember one time I was doing a conference uh, in Canton, Ohio. It was called the Supernatural Science and Prophecy Conference. And Tom Horn was going to be there, Derek and Sharon Gilbert, Russ Dizdar, I can't remember who else. There were some other people that were there. And I was under so much spiritual attack doing that conference. And the devil just kept saying, if you just stop this conference, if you just cancel it, everything will be all right. Everything will be all right. Just stop doing this. Stop doing this. And I was like, man, if I stop this, all this pressure will go away. And I thought for a second, I was like, you know what? I don't care what happens. I don't care if I lose everything. If I go in debt, we're going to go through with this conference. And I still, to this day, get people coming up to me. He's like, man, you're the one to put on that conference, right? Man, I can't tell you how much that meant to me, how much that changed my life, and how much that helped me. And I met this person, and this was the beginning of that. So it's amazing. I was just doing a conference. I didn't think about all that. I, I was doing it because I had fun doing it, you know, and, and I, I wanted other people to hear it, but I never realized the, the impact, you know, and, um, but no, thank you so much, Mike and uh, Kathy for doing this, for opening up your church, for bringing people here. Uh, it's amazing. It really is, and I, I've had so much fun. I cannot tell you how the enemy tried to get me to not come here yesterday. The fight that I had you know, Russ called me Thursday, and we had a talk. He's like, okay, you ready to go? I was like, ah, I'm ready to go. And two hours after that conversation, you know, there was an attack, and there was, some, there was a situation, and I woke up Friday morning, and I told my wife, I was like, well, I said, I think I'm just going to go Saturday, you know, and, um, but God is good. He gave me this grace that I can't explain, and uh, I just, you know, I came here. I felt so much peace. I love seeing people like uh, David Hevener here. Uh, the filmmaker. I know I'm going to hit my head on that. Is, are we going to get feedback if I come down here? Uh, it's so important to uh, support what he's doing, you know, and of course I'm a filmmaker too, so I'm a little bit biased about that, but um, the, what he's doing is going to touch so many people. So, you know, I don't know. I just, uh, I'm excited to have him here and him doing what he's doing. So how many people were here last year? A lot. But there were some who weren't, okay? So that's good, because I'm going to retell a story about how uh, everybody knows Coach Dave, okay? And I'm blown away by God's providence, okay? I already knew Coach Dave, but I ran into him in the airport in Texas flying back from, uh, from Dallas. And we started talking. I told him about this going on. He was telling me about he was doing this. And I was telling him about my daughter. And he's like, oh, really? He's like, you know, you, your daughter's interested in that. She should, uh, she should check out this ministry. And I said, okay, we'll check it out. And, man, I'm telling you what, I don't know what she would be doing if she wasn't doing that. And just, you know, the world would say it was coincidence or it was chance. You know, the providence of God. And what a whole that this ministry that she's doing right now has filled in her life. That's amazing. I'm just blown away by, 
I just happened to be there, you know, and then I just happened to bring that up to coach, you know, and then I was talking to uh, Preston and Kelly downstairs, and they told me how they got um, involved, not so much in this ministry, but connected with this group, you know, reconnected. They were at the Ark Encounter in south of Cincinnati in Kentucky, and they bumped into Derek Gilbert and struck up a conversation, and it pulled them into this. I didn't know any of that. They were on our show last summer, and I didn't know the backstory. So I'm just amazed at the providence of God. Um, Coach Dave, I met Coach Dave in Mansfield, and I used to go to these tea party meetings, and one day Coach Dave showed up there, and he was going like a madman, throwing chairs around, saying he was running for some office. And I was like, man, he was, I'm not kidding. And so back then we were doing, we were handing out these, uh, these 9-11 uh, DVDs with movies on them. And we're trying to warn people. It's like, hey, do you know about this? And I went up to give him one of those. He's like, I know about that, brother. So, and I was like, okay, good, good. So then I was like, I don't know about this guy. And I was doing, I was doing a conference and I was like, this guy's not really going to fit in to some of the other speakers, but I want to have him here. So let me just say, this was my idea a long time ago, even though I called Coach and he said he couldn't make it. I tried to get Russ and Coach together years ago, but uh, finally, you know, a few years later, it happened. It happened. So anyway, guys, I, wanna, I just want to talk to you about um, what I do tonight. I, I was up late last night. I worked on a presentation, and then I threw it all out this morning. So I just want to talk to you from the heart about what I do, where God has called me. You know, just talking about providence. I didn't ask for any of this. I didn't go looking for it. The Lord brought it to me. I, I began praying for truth is what I did in 2008. I was like, Lord, something doesn't seem right. You know, I, I know about JFK. 9-11 doesn't make sense to me. What's going on? And I began praying for truth. And long story short, I hear this guy named Russ Dizdar. You know, and again, Providence, you know, I connected with Russ Dizdar, and I found this church. The Lord gave this to me in a matter of minutes, and you guys know how this works. It's amazing, but the Lord laid it all out to me. He said, this is what's going to happen. So you're going to do a conference in this church, and this is who's going to be there, and I was like, I haven't even talked to this. I haven't even asked this pastor yet. Are you sure, Lord? Maybe we should run it by him first, and I went and talked to the pastor, and he said, yeah, we, we could do that here. And then I contacted Russ Dizdar, and Russ Dizdar said, you know what? Because this church is on, it's actually on 30. You know, when you go, it's at the crossroads of 30 and 71. He's like, I was driving by that church. And I said, I want to speak at that church. He said, I'll do it. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Yeah. That just blows me away. You know, God working behind the scenes. You know, I believe in the supernatural. I believe in the providence and just the the interruption of our lives with God, you know, and we, we witness it, we believe it, we believe in answered prayer and God moving and um, just amazing things like that happen, and obviously the other side, you know, gets involved too, and there's a dark agenda, and there's a supernatural dark thing that goes on, and uh, you know, the enemy, he orchestrates things, and he's patient, and he waits for years, you know, and um, I pray, I pray the same thing. I'm like, Lord, orchestrate. Orchestrate these things in our lives. So, uh, yeah, I made, a, I made a film called Detestable a couple years ago. The Lord called me to do that. I said, are you sure, Lord? And he said, yeah. And I said, are you sure, Lord? And I kept asking him, and he kept laying it out. And that's what we did. So then a little bit later on, this is, this is a new film I'm working on, by the way. Um, I, I can't wait to do this. I've been undercover for years working on this. Uh, it's going to be Russ Dizdar exposed. So <laughs> look, at, look for that. So don't tell him about it, though. I mean, I, I got, I'm, I'm even going to interview him for the film. You know, I, I could just sit up here and tell you stories about Russ Dizdar behind the scenes, you know, uh, for all my time. And it would probably be the best thing you saw all day. But, well, I'm just going to let him alone for right now. This guy, I don't know, he kills me. But I, I'm so thankful for him. I, I love picking on him, even though he's not here right now. So I will pick on him when he walks in the door. Don't worry. Guys, you see me at Through the Black. We built this platform because we wanted to let people know that, hey, this is what we're doing. 
And Jared and I had this idea. It's like, well, this is the stuff that we talk about. Why won't we just put it on air? So that's what we started doing is just kind of uh, taking our conversations live. So This is a War is the film that I've been working on. Okay, I'm working on several different projects right now. This is a War is the newest one. And I want to make sure that this is going to... Um, that this is going to be loud enough. Let me check the volume real quick here. So, and then let me, let me check my remote. Let's try this. See, there's things that I don't feel good to share on the camera and have go out because most people just wouldn't understand at least my willingness to be open about it. But I've suffered things um, that make me almost cry thinking about it. I grew up on Houston, Texas. I'm born in Houston, Texas, you know, I'm born from a rapist, I don't know, I stress it. Whether you are black or white or rich or poor, born or freeborn, all of us matter, all have value. Why have we seen such an explosion, literally, of occultism in the last 50, 60 years? Because we're hasty to the time of the return of Jesus Christ. We've been so dumbed down in our, in our theology, we don't recognize evil when we see it. So that's what I'm working on right now. And um, uh, just to go over a couple people, the, uh, the lady in there, her name is Johanna Michelson. How do I shut this thing down? So uh, Johanna Michelson wrote a book, uh, came out in the 80s, called The Beautiful Side of Evil, Her Experience in Mexico. And uh, we got to spend a lot of time with her when we were in California and just gave us so much information. So I was only, I mean, just able to put just a tiny bit, you know, of what she was talking about in the film. So, um, but anyway, uh, working hard on that and uh, excited about, uh, you know, how God's going to use this film. You know, this is a film that I want people to say, I want my lost loved ones to see this. You know, and I, I, want, I want Christians to see it too. I try to make films for believers to, to wake the church up, to reach, reach the church. Hey, look who it is. What do you know? Look at that guy right there. <laughs> I told you I was going to do that. <laughs> so this is a war. What kind of a war is it? We're going to talk about a couple things real quick. Guys, I'm a movie maker, not a not a talker person, okay? I'm not a Russ Dizdar, I'm going to get up here and yell, or Coach Dave, you know? I feel like I've got to light my head on fire to get everybody excited, you know? So these guys, these guys amaze me. It's a spiritual war. It's a spiritual war. Ephesians 6, 12, okay, I'm preaching to the choir, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms, Okay. I know that, but i got to keep reminding myself that because I want to take it into the flesh. I, w- I want to crack some jaws with the people that I deal with, with the people that I know. I really do. And i got to keep reminding myself, 
Lord, this is a spiritual war. I know, I know. And everybody's like, Tom, I want to do what you do. Maybe you might not want to do what I do, but we need more people doing what we do. You know, we really do. And uh, what you see, what you see us doing is, is not what we do. What, what we're doing when nobody sees us, the prayer, the study, you know, the worship, the, the time with God is the most important thing that we do. So um, this is, um, I'm going to struggle with this technology. C.S. Lewis said, there is no neutral ground in the universe. Every square inch, every split second is claimed by God and counterclaimed by Satan. Uh, so true, so true, guys. It's an informational war. Uh, all of this ties back to the spiritual, okay? Um, we're, gonna, we're just going to mention a couple of these different things. It's an informational war. It's a spiritual war. Obviously, uh, you know, um, Satan, father of lies. And we, we I, never, I never thought we would... Um, it just blows my mind, the lies and the deception and what we're up against on a daily basis and how it's just hard to have a, an honest conversation with somebody about politics. And that's something that's been brought up here, you know, at this conference. And I, I hate talking about politics for that reason, because we can never have an honest conversation. And even though the guy that I voted for won, he's, you know, he's flawed. But, you know, I thank God we dodged that other bullet. So, um... <laughs> Joseph, Joseph Goebel says, um, if you tell a lie big enough and keep repeating it, it will eventually come, uh, people will eventually come to believe it. The lie can be maintained only for such, for such time as the state can shield the people from, polit from political, economic, and or military consequences of the lie. It thus becomes vitally important for the state to use all of its powers to repress dissent for the truth is the mortal enemy of the lie, and thus by extension, the truth is the greatest enemy of the state. Man, we could talk about that. We could talk about that, but I, and it all goes back to the spiritual, okay? Because, you know, we can, as, as Christians, we can watch TV, we can watch some kind of a hearing, uh, you know, on C-SPAN, or something to happen in the chamber, or, you know, a congressman getting up there, but we can look with spiritual eyes and we can know that there's a power behind that human force that is influencing him, that is um, just doing whatever, you know. Um, obviously, we know um, 1 John chapter 5, Satan is in control of the, uh, the whole world. It's a physical war. It is. Because our enemy doesn't go by the spiritual rules. So sometimes we can get physically attacked. That's why as the believers in this country, for one thing, are the advocates for the Second Amendment. I don't, I don't want to hurt anybody. You know, I, I, would, I would consider myself a pacifist. You know, I, I don't want to start, I would never start a fight with anybody. I would never attack, even though, you know, I made a joke a little bit ago about wanting to get in the flesh and crack some jaws, you know. I have to yield to the Spirit. Our enemy is not that way, and we have to be prepared to, uh, you know, to protect ourselves, to protect our family. So, it's a tech war and AI. I don't want to get into this too much because Mark Trump's going to talk about this later on. But this is, this is directly connected to the spiritual thing. What's going to happen in technology, what's happening now, is going to completely flip our world upside down. And I can say that, and I can stand up here, and I can scream it, and I don't, still don't think I can get the point across of how serious that is. And we look at Moore's Law and the, uh, you know, the advancement of technology. And they keep setting, uh, the, the year was, 20, was 2045. I think they keep moving the year up about what, what's called, let me tell you, the singularity. So um, if anybody knows what this is, the techno technological singularity, or just the singularity, is the hypothesis that the invention of artificial superintelligence will abruptly trigger runaway technological growth, resulting in unfathomable changes to the human civilization. There's a domestic war, and I thought about this today. Um, you know, I could, I could make a list, you know, pages and pages long about the, about the wars that we fight, but there's a serious problem with, um, with home and family life, you know, and somebody brought up today just the lack of, you know, one of the greatest problems in this country is the um the missing fathers 
in this country. I cannot tell you how many people I counsel, how many people I pray with, and you do a little bit of research, you talk to them, there's a family dynamic that set them up for where they're at right now. And it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. And even, even in functional families, this happens. And we are just so impressionable and so fragile. And um, again, it, it, goes back, it goes back to the spiritual. So cult level warfare. I learned this from Russ. I'm like, what is that? What is that? Let me just explain it real quick. Cult level warfare is when cults, when satanic cults, when people involved in witchcraft, when people involved in any, any type of occult activity are doing rituals, are doing some kind of witchcraft, are doing some kind of a spell, and they dirty the air, they summon demons, they send it to you, they send it on you, they empower themselves, cult level spiritual warfare. The church doesn't know a thing about this. I, I, I can't even get them to understand the concept of spiritual warfare. But then we're going to talk about people who are actually doing rituals and casting spells to, to harm us, to influence us. You know, this has been years ago, but I was out at my church, um, and I went between Sunday school and church to run out to my car to grab something. And when I was out there, I saw a man, it was an Indian, uh, Indian man from India, and he was doing something on the field, and he had a stick. And I was like, what is going on with this guy? And he was obviously doing something and chanting something. And I caught him, and he came up off the field. We had a soccer field right by our church, and I engaged him, you know, and I was like, I just want to let him know, hey, I saw you. Hey, man, you want to come into this church? We're having church in here right now. Very not, he was not happy with me for engaging him. And I, you know, I pursued him for a second, and then he moved on. And I went and I, I told my pastor about this, you know, to try to bring some kind of alarm to him. He's like, oh, he'll, he'll probably be all right. You know, he thought that there, I thought that guy was a physical threat. That guy wasn't a physical threat. I didn't think he was going to put a bomb or pull out a gun. And I tried to explain to him, you don't get that this guy is, you know, summoning demonic presence and whatever, you know, God, whatever Indian God, the millions of them, and doing something, the same guy have been spotted at the local Christian bookstore doing something there, surrounding the place. So, and it's, uh, uh, it's just so frustrating that the, the, the church can't get this. So, real quick, uh, The Darkest of the Red is the film that I'm working on. It's a sequel to Detestable, okay? And I'm going to be talking about that as I'm explaining some of this stuff to you guys tonight. Okay, but this is what I've been working on. This is what I launched. In the meantime, I ended up, look, hey guys, look who it is. Well, you know, here comes coach. <laughs> I love you, coach. <laughs> um, this is the film that, that I'm working on, and I'm taking my time working on it. The first film I made, we did it real quick. We're going to take our time working on this, and I'll explain to you guys some of the stuff that we want to cover in this film. We, want to, we basically want to pick up where Detestable left off, but we want to talk about the entertainment industry. We want to talk about politics and how that plays in and uh, who's involved. I don't want to talk about that idiot. I don't have time. I don't want to talk about that moron. Okay, Jimmy Seville. Uh, died in 2011. This guy, what a creep, man. Um, so many people have identified this guy over in the U.K., as molesting them, being involved in satanic rituals, you know, and anytime you hear the BBC talk about this guy, he was a child molester, they won't talk about the satanic rituals, and every one of these, of these victims, of these survivors of what he did is talking about the things that he would do in the basement of the hospitals that he would go to over there. So uh, some of you guys know about this, some of you guys don't. Okay, the law of the Luciferian, Greg Reed taught me this, the guarantee of our tomorrow is today's perception that we do not exist, okay? Invisibility, secrecy is their weapon. And they will throw anybody under the bus. This happened in my town where it's the typical story of a, of a church daycare where um, dozens of kids were abused. Two teenagers went to prison. And 
the stories that the kids gave of the people, the adults involved in satanic rituals, the two teenagers went to prison for molesting the kids, okay? But there were many more people involved, okay? The law of the Luciferian guarantee of our tomorrow is today's perception that we do not exist. We see this every time. I'm, right now, I'm researching the McMartin case, and I didn't put the slide in here. I'm researching McMartin. I'm going back and looking at Franklin. I'm looking at the Hampstead right now. Do you guys know about Hampstead? I didn't put that slide in here. Two little kids just a few years ago, you watch their testimony and tell me they're not telling the truth. You can't teach kids, you can't coach them to say those sort of things with that kind of detail. Look up the Hampstead kids. We, we talked to the mother. Gatekeeper of D.C., you remember, remember this? This broke last summer. Gatekeeper of D.C. society, Sally Quinn, comes out as a cultist, use hex to kill people. Does anybody remember? I don't have it noted here. This was in Breitbart. She was married to some... Uh, newspaper publisher in Washington, D.C. So let's look at this. Let's just say it out loud. This is part of that Breitbart article. Let's just say it out loud. The most powerful people in our country are either outright occultists, are comfortable with witchcraft and Satanism, or are moving and shaking among those who are. Whether or not you believe in the power of the occult, that does not matter. Also beside the point is whether or not the Podestas and Quinn and those calling to have Trump hexed believe, okay? And this is in uh, context to what was going on last summer. What we do know is that these people have completely rejected any notion of a loving God and moved towards darkness. Furthermore, we also know that this darkness is not about consenting adults behaving badly amongst themselves. Rather, this is about them attempting to harness a power to control others, to manipulate events to their will, to hurt or outright kill those who offend or assault them. I really, I really want to stress this part. Our enemies are taking this very seriously, guys. And I, I'm struggling to get Christians to remember there's a spiritual warfare for more than like three weeks at a time, okay? And our enemies, they, that, that's all they do, okay? Th this is their goal. They don't really have any rules. They don't have anything else to do, apparently. So, the, and once you get a little bit of taste of that power, you want more and more and more and more. This is a nice looking guy. Owns a pizza parlor. Washington, D.C. Very influential. Top 50, one of the top 50 most influential people in Washington, D.C. Businessman. There's another picture of him. I don't know what he's doing there. So I'm not going to, I don't have time to talk about Pizzagate. Has anybody seen Ronald Bernard's testimony? It's all in Dutch. If, you're, if anybody's taking notes, write this down, okay? You got to watch about 30 minutes long. Ronald Bernard. This guy right here, I wish I could have interviewed him for my film because he goes on to explain how he was, he had an opportunity. Somebody said, hey, you want to launder this money for us? And he said, sure, sounds good. So he got to rub and elbows with these very powerful people and they would take him into places, introduce him to stuff. You know, it was sex parties. It was all kinds of orgies and debaucheries. He was okay with that until one day they took him to a place where there were kids on the altar. And you can watch his interview. Tell me he's not telling the truth. He breaks down and gets emotional, just like everybody in, in the film that I made did, when, they, when he explains what happens. And that's when he turned around and he walked away from it. Guys, this is crazy to say. And I live and breathe this stuff, and I research it, and I look at it, and it's difficult for me to believe that the person that I'm watching on TV, sometimes we know what they're doing, and then sometimes we don't know, but we suspect they're involved in something like this. This guy didn't name any names. Wish he would have. Write that down, Ronald Bernard. It's a, the, the whole interview is subtitled. So, but I tell you, you don't need a subtitle when you see him break down and begin weeping. From, from what he saw. It's a little thing I threw in there. This was from last summer. I tried to find an update on this. So we've been talking a lot about pedophiles. The Daily Caller reported last year at least 11 mayors accused, this is the ones we know about, 
of child sex related crime since 2016. I forgot to put the other slides in here. Uh, there was a mayor from Ohio that, that um, went to prison uh, for, um, for raping a four-year-old little girl. Cult level warfare. This is a real picture of a cultist. I covered his face up because I don't want to give him any more attention because he loves attention. I don't know how you to say his name, but he's dangerous. Okay? And he is, I'll say this boldly, he's training an army. He's training as many people as he can. And I follow him on Facebook. And he's training people to attack Christians. And he's training people to attack churches. He's training people to invoke demonic presence to become possessed. He's got several books out on, um, on, on how to do this. And he, um, if you sign up for his, uh, for his classes, pay a small fee, he'll teach you how to do it. I, I, this, this guy is dead serious. This guy is dead serious. I've had many discussions about this guy, but I'm very careful. I'm not afraid of this guy, but I'm not going to go poke a bear. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Uh, I'm not going to go start a fight with somebody because I've got enough fights going on right now. And this guy, don't get me wrong, this guy has real power. Obviously, we know God's power is so much greater than anything this, he's ever experienced. Or he, you know, we, we, we need to pray for him. But um, I, I'll tell you his name off stage, but I won't say it up here. Cult level spiritual warfare. Can I, man, do you guys realize how popular Satanism is becoming? And there's, you know, and I didn't explain this earlier, but there's, you know, there's several different types of Satanism. There's your theistic Satanism like uh, Anton LaVey, we know about that. And then you have your experimenters, your kids that are getting involved in it. Those guys are dangerous. I'm going to show you here in a minute, okay? And then here's a guy who claims he's just like a modern-day Crowley, Aleister Crowley, who is invoking this stuff, believes in demon possession, is seeking it out. This guy is dead serious. Milwaukee, this is from a few years ago, Milwaukee roommates, Rebecca and Raven um, arrested for satanic sex torture. They lured some guy up from another state, and he thought one thing. They had something else in mind, and man, was he disappointed. Okay, Miranda Barbour, 19 years old, Craigslist killer. Her testimony is amazing because she talks about how she was trained in Alaska to do human sacrifice, and she said the story so many times that we've heard. Man, I can't tell you how many times I've heard this. I can almost tell you what they're going to say when we meet them, when we talk to them, when we hear their testimony. How many times have I heard somebody say, I was too little to do it, and an adult put their hand over my hand, put a knife in my hand, and help me do the cutting. I lost track of how many times I heard that. She said the same thing, but it was a gun, and it was a satanic sacrifice. 19 years old, Craigslist killer. I'm just showing you guys some examples right now. Uh, Gregory Hale, Tennessee, 2014. Um, satanic killing, this is who he killed. Tennessee man killed, dismembered, and ate woman before bearing leftover body parts, police. You can look this up. What's the date? June 10th, 2014. These, these guys, keep in mind, these guys, and I don't know what his, what his denomination was, but we're talking about experimenters. We're talking, this guy might have got into this. He, may, he might not have got into this through his family generationally. He might have just been listening to some heavy metal music. That happens. And we see that, and that's a door, okay? And that's, I, I don't know the whole story behind this guy, but this, this girl's dead. He killed her and ate her, okay? So, I, I mean, we don't know. And th there's so many ingredients that can go into this, you know, when we're talking about military, we're talking about all kinds of programming and things like that. So, anybody heard of Icy Sloan Hawkins? Let me ask you this. Have you ever heard of Jean Shepard? Country singer. That's her granddaughter, killed by a Satanist. December 23rd, 2016. So that was her boyfriend. Uh, country great Jean Shepard's granddaughter was murdered by her Satanist boyfriend. So, and it goes on. 2016, two years ago. Guys, I've only got just a tiny bit of these stories. 
there's so many more. There's so many more, and I found three just within the last day that I added to this. Um, to I, that I added to this. These two here lured a girl out. This was in Missouri, uh, St. Joseph, Missouri. Lured a lonely girl out, told her that they were going to be her friend, and killed her. Uh, here's the story. A teenager pleaded guilty to murder Monday, telling a judge the death was related to satanic worship. 2016, okay? What satanic, what, satanic panic, what's that? Satanic panic, that's not happening. Hey, don't worry about it. Amanda Bennett, 17, pleaded guilty to a charge of second-degree murder and the death of Caitlin Root last October. You can go and look at her obituary. It's real. It's a real story. I'm not making this up. She said the 17-year-old's death was a planned satanic sacrifice offered by herself and Sebastian Dowell. This is cult-level spiritual warfare, okay? And this, is, this, this falls into the physical part, too, Okay? Just found this today. This just happened, 2018. Satanic, satanic Christian couple in child porn case caught by FBI Cincinnati Task Force. Cincinnati Inquirer, April 20th, 2018. A special agent and police officer working for FBI Cincinnati Task Force helped uncover systematic sexual abuse of children. Sorry to have to read this. I hate reading this stuff, but I want to expose it. Um, Systematic sexual abuse of children by a woman and a man who claimed they were in a satanic Christian couple court document show. Uh, the court, the couple, and this is going to be too small for you to read, the couple sexually abused six children who were in their care and produced multiple images of child pornography, officials said. Federal prosecutors in a news release called the couple's behavior depraved and said it was represented ongoing systematic and horrific abuse of multiple children. Oh, man. I, can't not, I cannot tell you how important David Arthur's ministry is. I cannot tell you how important it is. And I'm so glad he's here. And I'm so glad that he's going to be doing what he's doing. You know, I was talking to him downstairs earlier and uh, told him that I was uh, watching, if anybody's seen this trailer for this new film that they're going to make about Queen and Freddie Mercury, okay? Who died of the exact same thing that David Arthur had and got healed from, right? I... Man, my heart breaks for Freddie Mercury, and I, I don't know what happened to him, but they're going to make a hero out of this guy. And they're going to say, they're going to say, man, too bad he didn't live now because he could have lived longer. But man, he was a great guy. He was a great guy. Man, we got to support David Arthur. We got to get him out there. We got to get this message out there. So I just, I cannot stress that enough. This, uh, this was just recently, I forgot to put the date on it. Pennsylvania man with razor blade performed satanic ritual. This has been in the last couple months. Performed satanic ritual on passed out woman, police say, 21-year-old man behind bars in Pennsylvania. After being accused of performing what he said was a satanic ritual on a passed out female friend with a razor blade, according to the report on Friday. I'm pretty sure this was in the last two months. It might have been, it might have been May. So, sacrifice to Satan. Mum, 42. You guys might have heard of this one. Butchered in satanic ritual. This was down at the bottom, May 7th, 2018. Okay? So... Let me just finish. Butchered in satanic ritual by devil worshipers who carved stars into her palms and left the body, uh, and left body by um, chilling message. Uh, the woman's corpse, this happened in Honduras, was found in Honduras and was reportedly sacrificed in bizarre ceremony. Guys, they tried. Remember when we talked about the information war? Okay. They had an ingenious idea back in the late 80s, early 90s called satanic panic. It was ingenious. It was good. I don't, I, I don't know how much, what kind of bonus the guy that came up with that got. But they used that to try and say that this stuff was not going on. What's the guy's name? Lanning. Kenneth Lanning. Okay. He determined, he determined that satanic ritual abuse was not real. You know how he did? Because he got thousands of people saying it was real and he couldn't prove it. Couldn't prove it. Thousands of people saying, tens of thousands, that this is happening with no ability to connect, no ability to network, share stories, and he determined that it wasn't real. Not only was it real then, it's still happening. These last three stories in the last few months. This is from last year. 
June 17th, I want you to pay attention, okay? Satanic Temple joins Planned Parenthood and pro-abortion crusade, okay? So we talked about the possible, maybe Luciferian generational type Satanists who are doing these murders. We don't know how they got in. Could have been heavy metal music, whatever, okay? Um, this is a group, the Satanic Temple, who lean more towards somebody like Anton LaVey, uh, atheistic Satanist, completely ridiculous. These guys are such a joke, but they're not a joke. You know why? Because they joined with Planned Parenthood in a pro-abortion crusade. This story was from last year, okay? So, um, and here's the update. This was, um, actually this is a I can't go back, but Missouri has reportedly doubled its abortion capacity this year thanks to the Satanic Temple and Planned Parenthood who have worked in tandem to fight the state's restrictions on abortion. That's in Missouri. These guys are making it their business to kill babies any way they can. The church is the only true enemy of Satan. This is from uh, Bob Rosio and uh, Hitler in the New Age. Love this book. Get it for a couple bucks on Amazon. Heard it. Russ told me about it years ago. I got it and read it. It's a powerful book. And man, yeah, read this book. The church is the only true enemy of Satan, the only foe capable of understanding and hindering his plan. The church must, however, study her enemy and his plans more thoroughly <laughs> in light of biblical prophecy in order to, to do more effective spiritual battle. So guys, I, I have no clue how I got here. God called me this. I wasn't, I, I wasn't planning on doing this. I want My original idea is I want to make a movie for entertainment. That was sincerely my idea. I thought, man, I heard of this guy, Russ Dizdar. I was like, man, this guy, this guy's creepy. I'm going to interview this guy. I'm going to make a movie out of what he's talking about because Hollywood, they make movies on this, but none of it's real. It's all fake. I'm going to do the real thing. Well, he tricked me into working for him <laughs> for 10 years, and I finally got away, and I made my own movie. No, but what I'm saying is God called me to this. God called me to this. It's providential. I'm blown away by the providence of God. And I cannot deny, I cannot deny his movement in my life. And we can testify, we can, we can tell stories in here. You know, we, we, we did a little bit earlier, you know. I, I just want to share um, a, a couple testimonies from, um, from the film. You guys won't be able to read this, but I'm going to read it to you. Um... Hey guys, just wanted to thank you again for all the work you're doing. I rented Detestable on my own a while back and watched it again with my parents last night. And wow, it was amazing how God touched our hearts with this film last night. It was the catalyst for a family blessing explosion. My father is an ex-Southern Baptist pastor, parole officer, and both my parents in their 70s are teachers at their church. To make a long story short, I've never seen my dad move freely by the Spirit. He's always had this religious performance-based thing that he does, the, the base thing going on. When the credits started rolling, my dad was crying and got down on his knees in the middle of their living room and began to pray. I've never seen him do this. I've only seen him, him pray in a rehearsed manner, and he is very bound up in performance, rejection, self-loathing. Uh, this may seem like a small thing, but it was huge for him. My mom and him joined Excuse me, my mom and I joined him and we had a time of prayer that we've never had together before in our lives. It was real and the Holy Spirit just fell on us. I have longed and prayed that my dad would have freedom and authentic relationship with Christ before he leaves this earth. During our praying, I was able to release my dad from much blame, father wound stuff I placed on him over the years. And it was a freeing ev evening for us all. When we were through praying, my dad was beaming, saying he hadn't felt this good in a long time. It was a very sweet and true blessing. Both my parents said if they showed your film at their church, most people would think they were Looney Tunes. I can see that. 
But the power of Christ displayed in this film can't be denied, and I personally think it will make an impact wherever it's shown. That's all glory to God. That's not me. If you knew, if you knew about me, if you knew about me, you'd be like, ah, oh, you're not making a movie, okay? But that's all, that's all God, okay? But I just, I say that because, and I talked about David Hevener and the work he's doing and the impact, you know, of film that we can do, okay? And we're all doing, you know what I'm saying? Um, we're all exposing the lies and revealing the truth. So this is another letter. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna read this one. Guys, I want to tell you about this guy right here, real quick. I don't know who he is. I know who he is, but I don't know him. I never met him. My daughter met him in Louisville at the last abortion clinic last summer. Okay, dedicated his life to the Lord, got baptized, ready to be a preacher, ready to stop abortion, ready to stand up against it. Hit in the last few months with cancer on his spine, cancer wrapped all up in him everywhere. His dad's been taking him all over the place trying to save his life, and people have been stepping in and praying and, and, and reaching out to him. And I've been watching, just like blown away. Some of you guys know, some of you guys know his story. And some of you guys heard of a, uh, a thing called uh, Make-A-Wish, where, you know, in situations like this, they, they have money and they come in. And they say, hey, what do you want to do? Go to Disney World or whatever. And Jeremiah, know what he wanted to do for his make a wish? He says, set me up with a governor. I want to talk to the governor. I got to tell him to stop abortion. And I'm just saying this to challenge you and to challenge me. What are you doing with your life? I'm overwhelmed with the things I'm doing, but I feel like I'm not doing enough. And I, I fall short a lot. This, this guy blows me away. This guy blows me away. I'm excited. I'm excited because people are getting saved and there's a generation that's coming up. And this guy, Father, I pray, save him. Save his life. Heal him. But if he doesn't make it, he's going down swinging to save babies. And I'm just like, and I, I show this to my kids. I'm like, I want you to look at Jeremiah. Look at what he's doing. It's an inspiration. That guy's a hero. But it's a challenge to you and to me, and I want to bring that up. Pray for him. Look it up on Facebook. Pray for Jeremiah. If you want to know more about it, Rusty Thomas is his dad. Never met him. Rusty Thomas is probably coach, one of the number one guys in America fighting abortion. Yeah, yeah. So coach knows him, coach knows him. So what happened to it? Lost it. Wake up the sleeping giant. I'm encouraged and I'm discouraged. And then I get encouraged again. I don't know how many people we're going to get woke up. That's what we talk a lot about at this conference. And I'm thinking of strategies. And I'm like, well, how can we do this? How can we reach people? How can we have a conversation with them just to get them to understand the, 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 just the tiniest truth? How can we get them out to the abortion clinics? And I talked about this before. I'm going to, I'm going to talk about it real quick right now. A lot of people won't show up because they're defeated. If you are, repent. Whatever it is. Whatever it is. I did that for a long time. I didn't show up because I didn't feel worthy. I'm not. I'm not. But if I got something, if I got a stronghold, I repent. I break it. Best advice I can give, somebody gave to me, a friend of ours, Gary, gave it to me one day, and it, it changed a lot of things for me. And he said, get back up. Get back up. And it was so simple. But so many times when I slipped or falled, I would just lay there for a couple weeks and be ineffective. And the enemy loves that. And one of his jobs is to destroy our spiritual lives so we can't make a difference. And that's why a lot of people don't show up because their spiritual lives are a mess. So I share this, and, it, you know, and I'm sure it, it relates to people in this room, but also I always say, hey, it could be your neighbor. You know how many times I had... 
Somebody tell me that, hey, I watched your video. It wasn't for me, but I went and told somebody else about it. So, guys, repentance is a powerful weapon that we can use because when we have unrepented sin, that's a tool in the devil's back pocket, and he's waiting to use that. We need to disarm him and say, Father, I shouldn't have done this. I repent. I renounce it out of my life. I don't want to have anything else to do with, with it. You know, pick me up, clean me off. I'm gone. Okay, I hope everybody can hear this. This is, a, uh, this is an excerpt. This is not going to be in my film, but I want you to hear this, um, hear this testimony. This is a guy out of Columbus, Ohio, and he's just going to tell a little bit about his, uh, his testimony. There's a lot more to it, but I, I wanted to share this with you. So let me, where's my volume at? I want to make sure, th this might be hard to hear, but if anybody wants to hear it on a break or something, I'll play it for you. In 2011, I came here um, as a regular man and was inducted into the Freemasons as an entered apprentice. That involved a ritual that um, stripped me of my normal possessed clothing that I owned, dressed me as a slave, blindfolded me, put a noose around my neck. Uh, the uh, first step of the ritual was a physical threat met with uh, a sharp edge into my chest. I went around the room uh, not knowing exactly what was going on, hearing sounds and having scriptures uh, quoted out of context, being presented to different men for their approval. At one point I was led to the center of the lodge, put on my knees, and when I had the uh, blindfold revealed, I was surrounded by a group of men all the way around me, at which point I was said to be brought to light. At that point I was an official mason. Uh, at that point I realized that I was not surrounded by goth kids that were listening to metal in mom's basement and doing things for fun. I realized that this was absolutely serious that I had just partaken in an ancient ritual that was designed for things that probably I didn't even grasp at the time. And it was carried out by very important, very smart, and very serious men. Men that don't put this on, uh, you know, this image for, for attention. They are using it for power, and they are using it very seriously as it was designed. And uh, since that time, in the seven years, I let that vow and that oath lay on my soul and own me, but after coming to Christ, the same with any other ties, any other oaths that I may have had upon my body, they were completely conquered, and I was set free through the salvific love and the blood of Jesus Christ. The one thing that could conquer this did. After that, I did go through a very systematic, direct, vocal uh, rebuking and breaking of all those ties, so that not only did I hear it, but any private powers or principalities could hear it and have no denial. The victory was won by Jesus at the, at the cross, but I wanted to declare my authority to the world in the same sense that you would a baptism. So the deliverance uh, ministry was part of breaking the ties, and since then I, I absolutely feel free. I know I'm free, and I'm promised to be free. God's words never come back void, and that's the truth in this. And as I stand here, there's no tie, there's no power, there's no regret, there's no intimidation, there's no fear. I feel total victory and almost a sense of elation at, at the fact that Jesus does destroy this kind of evil left and right with no problems. J. Brett Prince, he was one of those guys. He was one of those guys. He was on his way to becoming one of those guys that committed those crimes. He was a Satanist, called himself a Luciferian. You see a tattoo right here in his eye as a sigil of Lucifer. He has right across his chest, do what thou wilt. He has a baphomet on his throat. I asked him privately when we were, when we were driving. I said, and said oh, he said I could say this. I said, would you have committed a human sacrifice? He said, oh yeah. He said, I wanted the power. He said, I wanted to go all the way. I was trying to find my way to Bohemian Grove. That's good news, that he's saved. And as crazy as those other stories that we've seen are, we know, we have the answer. And it's weird hanging out with that guy 
Because the people that I get frustrated with and mad with, he's like, they can be saved. Because I was saved. He was doing rituals out of the book of the guy that I showed you earlier. He, he lived, I mean, everything, I mean, he was surrounded by the, the he, he was living in a Masonic lodge in the basement doing rituals in an odd fellow's lodge down the street. Just, I mean, and his, his wife's story is more intense than his. Amazing. And it, I'll, just, I'll just tell you this. She grew up in an atheistic home. You guys, look it up. Her name is Kim Prince. It just came out this week. Okay, write that, write that down. Uh, and the name of his YouTube show is called The Good Ground, by the way. And his whole testimony is on there, okay? But she, did, she never heard of Jesus. She didn't know. She grew up in an atheistic home. She had a dream one night, uh, was taken out into a field, and saw a, a figure that was light. She couldn't look at it. And she asked this person who was like a shepherd there, she's like, who is that? And um, the figure said, Yahweh. And she's like, I don't know what Yahweh is. She woke up, looked it up on her phone. Yahweh is a Hebrew name for God. She began praying to God. She got saved and she began praying for her husband. They have been separated for a year. Unbelievable. Romans 1.16. Power of the gospel. He was succeeding. He was going up in his business. He was a tattoo artist. Everything was going his way. And then he said those powers began wanting back from him. And everything turned around. And his life began falling apart. Man, I'm telling you, I'm excited. I'm excited because that dude, that dude is saved. He's on fire for the Lord. And he wants to do full-time ministry. I haven't seen anything like it in a while. But there's hope. There's hope. We can reach these people. Spiritual warfare, praying, standing in the gap. The other side is sold out. The other side is completely focused on what they want to do. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? I don't know what you're called to. I'm not going to say it, but the Lord will let you know. The Lord will let you know. Be sensitive to him. Man, the things, the things that can happen. The things that can happen. I never look for this. The providence of God. I told, I told the story earlier about running into coach in the airport. Completely open up a door for ministry in my daughter's life. Me meeting Russ. You know, just all these things. So one day I'm at work. I'm actually listening to Russ on my on my uh, earbuds, one of his teachings, I believe it was the 11th hour of one of his long, uh, you know, teachings that he does, and he was talking about evangelism, and he just kind of broke out, and he's like, I want to talk about evangelism, he's talking about how he would go to hospitals, and, and go room to room, and reach people, and I was like, Lord, I'll go to a hospital right now, I'll clock out of work, and I'll go to a hospital right now, I'm ready to go, and I walked across the room, and I was doing my job, I'm not kidding you, it was a moment. This lady came up to me and she said, I need you to go to the hospital. My mother-in-law is in the hospital. Wow. I went that night, I went after work. She was not looking too good. She was not conscious. Family's desperate, they want me to reach her. I went, couldn't do anything. She wasn't, prayed for her, prayed for the family, prayed for her. That was on a Thursday. Oh, my wife and I, we had something planned that night, and I couldn't even focus on what I was doing. I just kept praying for Dorothy. The next, uh, the next night was a Friday night Bible study at Russ's. I was on my way out of town, and I was like, ah, maybe I should go back and see if she's okay. I was like, no, nah, just go on. Go on up. But I went. I went to the hospital. Dorothy was conscious. I explained to her how to get saved. I explained to her repentance. I said, I asked her, are you understanding everything I'm saying? She said, yeah, yeah. She said, I want that. She prayed a prayer of repentance. Got saved. What I'm saying is when we yield ourselves to God, 
It's, we don't just read about the miracles in God's word. It's not just for somebody else to experience. The providence of God moving and putting us in places. The Holy Spirit, I love it. The Holy Spirit decides what gifts we're going to get. I'm glad I'm not in charge of that. But no, it's the providence of God and he knows. And I don't know what you're called to. I don't know what you're called to, but if you don't know, then, then figure it out. That's all, that's all I can say. I, I didn't know I was going to be doing this. If, and I'm glad I didn't pick because I wouldn't have picked this. God is good. God is faithful. I, I just want to testify to his goodness. I told you, I told you that uh, you know, I'm going through a trial. I've been going through it ever since I released this film. And many times I thought, if I knew these things were going to happen, would, would I have done this? Sometimes I didn't have an answer, but I'm telling you now I have an answer. I do, and I did then, but yes. Yes, because it's all worth it. It's all worth it because God is moving and he's using this, and everything the enemy means for bad, God's going to turn it around. So God is good. Thank you, Pastor Mike, for, for doing this kind of conference, man. You're out of your mind? What's going on? Who does, who does this kind of thing, man? I don't even know. So God bless you guys. Thanks. Throughtheblack.com is the website.